It took me one year to carefully develop my plan to take revenge on the one who encroached on my marriage. I am a modest person, and I may seem harmless. But if it concerns my honor and dignity, then I will punish the offender and do it in the most cunning and terrible way. Enjoy watching. After six years of living together, Ellie and I were on the verge of realizing our plans. Since the beginning of our marriage, we had adhered to a strict savings plan, and finally, we had accumulated enough for a down payment on a mortgage and planned to start a family. My name is David Wallace. I run my own business in the cybersecurity field, which allows me to work remotely since I don't need an office. If someone asked me about my marriage to Ellie, I would say that we deeply love each other and are committed to our union. I would talk about how we share every secret and intimacy, enjoy an amazing sex life, and unbreakable love. Between our love, financial situation, and joint plans for the future, I would bet my life on our future being secure. There were moments when we saw other couples facing difficulties and divorces only to realize that our love and marriage were on a completely different level and nothing could separate us. Illusory thinking is not a deliberate process, but it convinces your soul and turns into belief. I was a believer. Ellie worked as a regional manager at a national technology company. The company was growing and a new vice president was transferred from the office in Manhattan. Richard Jones was a young, confident Ivy League graduate, one of those who considered themselves smarter than everyone else and liked to demonstrate their power and status to subordinates. That's when my belief system began to be tested. Ever since he appeared three months ago, my wife became cold, irritable, and not particularly pleasant at home. She explained it as stress at work, but I suspected it was something more. I tried to be a caring husband, show patience, bring home flowers, arrange dates at her favorite places, and try to understand her problems. One evening, when she was upset, she told me about her new boss. She said Richard was a real jerk and caused nervousness and stress for everyone. I suggested she quit, but she said she had applied for a transfer to another department of the company and that we needed the money for our new home. She said it was not the time to leave and wanted to wait a little longer. Ellie explained that she had a good chance of transferring thanks to her experience working with the company's software and being valued at the head office. Her current job required her to visit other branches three times a month, and now she hoped she would only need to make one or two more business trips before her transfer was approved. Six weeks and three business trips had passed. There was no transfer, and the stress at home only grew. Because of this, she began to treat me more like a roommate than a husband. I expressed my dissatisfaction, but she said to endure and that things would soon improve, as Richard had begun to treat the staff better. Her colleagues at work thought that perhaps the head office had informed him of the poor morale in the office and suggested he change his attitude. She also believed that the transfer could still happen. I noticed she was trying to be kinder at home, but still treated me coldly, unwilling to have sex more than twice a week. And even then, it seemed to me out of pity rather than the love we once shared. On Friday evening, she returned home and announced she was going on a business trip to the corporate office in California for two days with her boss, Richard Jones. She said she would find out about her transfer there. At that time, I didn't know that her stress was caused by pressure from Richard, who insisted on having sex with her. Ellie was an attractive 28-year-old woman, 5 feet 7 inches tall, slender, with a large chest, and an angelic face. Until the last three months, Ellie had never given me cause for concern. Later, I learned that when Richard began his predatory actions, she rejected him, which humiliated him and hurt his ego and this was the reason for her work stress. Obviously, it was pure sexual harassment, and why she didn't tell me or her HR department goes beyond my understanding and remains a mystery. After Richard realized his methods weren't working, he changed tactics and began flirting, teasing, complimenting, and promising Ellie a great future in the company. 
After several lunches and many conversations about her marriage and sex life, he convinced her to consider being with him at least once and what it would mean for her future. All the stress she was under, combined with the impending act of betrayal, turned her into this devilish woman, and apparently, the way to cope with the upcoming affair was to blame me and turn me into the villain to justify her one-time deceit and conceal her guilt. We haven't had sex or been close for the past two weeks and she hasn't shown any interest in my advances. I'm not begging for sex and have made it clear to her that if things don't change soon, we're headed for a bad outcome. She promised that everything would return to normal soon and asked for some time to sort out her work issues. I loved her and wanted to get back to how things were just a few months ago, but I didn't know what to do, except realizing that changes were necessary, so I let her know that I'm waiting for her to return from her trip to sort out our marriage as soon as possible. Our seventh anniversary was approaching, and I continued to try to mend things between us, trying to reignite her feelings before her trip, but to no avail. On the day she was supposed to leave town, I came home early to surprise her with a box of her favorite chocolates for the trip, to show her how much I love her and how much I want our life to be back on track. I knew she had taken the day off to pack and was planning to leave for the airport at 3 p.m. I returned home at noon with a smile on my face, hoping to surprise her and tell her how much I love her. As soon as I entered the house, I called out to her, barely crossing the threshold. But to my surprise, the house was empty. Walking into the bedroom, I saw her luggage on the bed and an elegant dress on the hanger. She always dressed tastefully, was confident, and loved to look fashionable, and I always liked how she looked. Standing alone in our bedroom, I called her on her mobile to find out where she was and received a short and curt response. Hello, what do you need? She said, sounding annoyed by my call. It was hurtful. Despite all my efforts, I felt like I was bothering her and that I was the one she didn't want to talk to. Well, that's a pretty cold greeting. I wanted to know how your day was going and what you're up to. Listen, I'm having lunch with my sister. You already know I'm leaving for the airport at three. Is there anything else you need to know? Stunned by her demeanor, I simply wished her a pleasant flight and hung up, not saying goodbye or that I love her. Usually, I ended our conversations like that, and I wondered if she even noticed. I was hurt and angry, sitting on the bed next to her suitcase on wheels, trying to figure out what the hell was going on. The way she talked to me and treated me was unacceptable. Anger began to build up as I sat there, staring at my phone. I hadn't planned on waiting for her to return home, so I decided to leave the house. As I got up to leave, my gaze caught on an item of purple color in her open suitcase. I had never rummaged through my wife's things before, but for some reason, I approached the suitcase and took out a plastic bag with a purple item. To my horror, I pulled out an unopened package containing a bright purple sexy nightgown. The bag also contained sexy panties and a matching purple bra, as well as unopened garter stockings in purple. Considering that she hadn't worn lingerie for me in the past two years, I realized she had specifically packed this for someone else. Suddenly, everything fell into place. Then I examined the suitcase more closely and found a box of condoms in the side pocket, still in the CVS package. Everything clicked into place then. Her attitude towards me, the lack of sex, the coldness, the distance. Everything had changed between us since she started going on business trips with her boss three months ago. I realized I held evidence of her infidelity in my hands. She packed these things for the trip to show them to another man, most likely Richard. In an instant, I knew I no longer wanted to be a part of her games or be cuckolded. I went down to my office, took a sheet of paper, and wrote a short note. Trembling with anger, I wrote, Ellie, I hope he likes your sexy lingerie. Now it's clear why you've changed over the past few months. Obviously, you no longer want me. Don't worry. When you come home, I won't be here anymore, and you'll never see me again. I would never have married you if I knew you were a cheater, but as they say, live and learn. The only good thing to come out of this is that you'll never be the mother of my children. Thank God we waited to start a family.
Maybe Richard can help you with that. David. Then I took a stapler from my desk drawer, carefully opened the lingerie package, and attached the note to her expensive and delicate fabric. Then I neatly put everything back in the suitcase. I made sure not to leave any traces of my presence at home and went to a local restaurant to be alone and eat something to soothe my upset stomach. I met up with my sister Jenny for lunch because I needed to confide in someone about what I was planning to do. Call it guilt or fear, but I knew I could trust her as a good listener. All this tension was driving me crazy, and I needed to get it off my chest before my head exploded from everything I had been going through. After we ordered from the menu, I confessed everything and felt relieved to have spoken up. I felt Jenny's anger as she looked at me as if I had lost my mind. Why would you jeopardize your marriage for this jerk? In past conversations, you told me he was a jerk and that he had been harassing you for the past few months. Why don't you just quit or file a complaint with HR for sexual harassment? Jenny, in the past month, I've gotten to know him better, and he's going through a tough divorce. He's been taking his pain out on us, but he's been extremely kind this past month. He asked to be with me just once, and I don't know why, but I agreed. We'll do it just once during this trip, and he promised we'll never speak of it again, and he'll help me get a promotion in the company. So, you're going to cheat on David, the guy you've loved since college, for what? A possible promotion? Do you realize he's turning you into a prostitute, right? No, it's not like that. I genuinely feel sorry for Richard, and I know he needs this. Besides, David will never find out, and we'll go back to our normal lives when I return. Sorry, David is calling me. Let me answer. Hello, what do you need? David, I'm having lunch with my sister. You already know I'm leaving for the airport at 3. Do you need to know anything else? Okay. As I put the phone back in my bag, I wondered why Jenny was looking at me with disgust. I turned to her and with anger in my voice asked, What? Ellie, did you just talk to your husband like that? That was the rudest thing I've ever seen from you. What's going on with you? What are you talking about, Jenny? Do you even realize how you just spoke to David? Have you lost your mind? Jenny, what are you on about? It was just a quick call, that's all. You picked up the phone and said, What do you want? Can you imagine what my husband would do if I spoke to him like that? And how did you end the conversation? Do you need anything else? No, goodbye. No, I love you. No, I'll miss you. How do you think he feels after that conversation? Jenny, what's going on with you? I'm worried about your sanity and how you're behaving. Oh my God, I didn't even realize I was talking to him like that. Did I really say that? What was I thinking? Ellie, I think your thoughts about the upcoming affair have already affected your judgment and are jeopardizing your marriage. You yourself told me that you're tired of David's complaints about how bad things are between you two and how you ignore him. Listen, it seems to me you're sabotaging your own marriage and treating your husband like trash to compensate for the guilt you must be feeling. Oh my God, you're right. I've been acting like a jerk, dumping my problems on poor David. I need to call him back and apologize. Do you need privacy? No, stay here. He's calling. Damn, he's not picking up. Maybe he's busy. He always answers my calls. I'll try again. Hopefully, he'll pick up. He's still not answering? Ellie, send him a message. Damn, he's mad. And now I don't blame him. And I need to leave in less than two hours. Well, sis, you better apologize and get yourself together. I don't think what you've planned with Richard is a good idea, and you need to stop this nonsense before you ruin everything. You and David have been getting along so well, and you're planning to start a family. Think about it, Ellie. I know, you're right, but I'm not sure I can stop it. It'll be just this once, and my home and work life will be back to normal. Richard has such issues with his divorce, and he's really depressed. He promised it would only be once, and it'll help him because I remind him of his wife. Do you realize he's manipulating you? Ellie, you can't be this naive. No, I feel it. Deep down, he's a good guy, and his wife is trying to get full custody of the kids and bankrupt him with alimony. When he opened up to me, I felt his pain, and we connected. I feel like I need to do this, just this once after all the time we've spent together. Have you talked to him about your marriage or how David treats you? Looking down at her hands and after a long pause, 
Ellie replied in a quiet voice. I might have mentioned that David complains and we have problems with sex. Ellie, you're being foolish, and you'd better pray, David never finds out you're sharing your intimate affairs with another man. I have to tell you, Ellie, I think you've already gone too far, and if David finds out about this, your marriage will definitely be in jeopardy. Can't you see how twisted this is and how you're risking everything? I understand, you're right. That's why it'll only happen this one time. Now I see how I've been treating David, and when I come back from this trip, I'll make it right. He'll never know, and it won't happen again. I won't ever speak of it again because it won't be in my mind, it'll be forgotten. You're really living in illusions. You're planning to have sex with another man and think you'll just forget about it afterward? I'm telling you, it will change you. It will change your relationship with your husband. Nothing good will come out of it. Please reconsider. Jenny, thank you for your concern, but I'm a grown woman and I can handle this. After all, it's just sex and it's only once. David will never find out, and as they say, no harm done, no guilt. Well, I hope you know what you're doing, but I want you to remember my words. You're making a big mistake. Please think about it before doing something that can't be undone. You'll forever be known as a cheating wife, and I hope you can live with that. Don't worry, I'll handle it, and in two weeks, you'll see a happy David, and we'll start working on starting a family. It saddens me, and it terrifies me, because I know this won't end well, and as your sister, I don't want you to do this. Please cancel your trip, quit your job, and apologize to David for your recent behavior. David is my friend too, and if he ever finds out that I knew about this, he'll never speak to me again. Thank you, Jenny. These feelings were new and unwelcome. Sitting in the booth of our local restaurant, I began to reflect on the past few months and how my marriage had shifted from bliss to complete despair. I had to wipe my eyes several times to conceal my weakness and pain from anyone who might see. When I first sat down, I felt only anger, but those feelings turned into sadness and agony as I felt the full weight of loss. The woman I loved and the marriage I cherished were now distant memories. Then, as I pondered my situation, my feelings shifted to ones of humiliation and betrayal. How could she do this to me and to our marriage? What had I done to turn her into a cheating bitch? I knew I couldn't forgive her. I could never be with a woman who wanted to be with another man. My ego could never endure that. I know many of my friends have overcome infidelity and would tell me to forgive her and move on. Well, that's not going to happen. Then suddenly, my feelings of anger returned as my phone rang, and I saw Ellie's number. I wasn't going to take her calls. The time for talk is over, darling. Your sweet, loving husband has moved on. You've awakened a monster. Richard had booked first-class seats for their long flight to the West Coast, aiming to impress Ellie. However, on the plane, he noticed she was upset when he learned that her husband wasn't responding to her calls and messages. When she told Richard that she was beginning to doubt everything, he quickly realized and played the offended husband card again to bring her back to her initial mood. He treated her to a Bloody Mary and persuaded her to relax, reassuring her that everything would be fine. Ellie, calm down. Everything is okay, and I'm sure there's a good reason for this. Maybe he's in a meeting or just can't talk. He'll call you back, I'm sure. Besides, nothing has happened and everything is fine. When we return from our meetings, I want you to take a few days off and spend time reconnecting with your husband. I wish I had a loving wife like you. You know, she doesn't even let me talk to my daughters and it hurts so much. You're a wonderful wife and I know everything will be okay. Ellie noticed a tear in the predator's eye as he spoke about his daughters and once again believed his words. After the second drink, she forgot about her problems and took his hand, trying to comfort the suffering man. That's when he knew she was his, and he would finally be able to have sex with this stupid bitch and send her back to her husband, still carrying his sperm. He had worked too hard for it all to end so close to the finish line. It was a game for him. Sending women back to their husbands filled with his seed was the purpose of his life. For the wife to know she had given herself to another man and at the same time lost respect for her husband. The wife would remember what they had done and keep it in mind when returning to her husband. 
But even more, he enjoyed meeting the husband after defiling his wife at a business event or chance encounter. When this happened, he felt an indescribable sense of power. It was a drug, and he was addicted to these feelings that made him feel powerful and whole. It also made him a dangerous man in the company of these poor, stupid, and trusting women. When they arrived at the hotel holding hands, they approached the reception desk. Ellie was slightly shocked to realize that there was only one room available and that she would spend the entire vacation with him. Walking away from the desk, she looked up at Richard and said, I don't have my own room. Ellie, we discussed this. You and I will be together for the duration of this trip and never again. Let's just enjoy this experience as we promised each other. I thought you said it would only be once. Richard, I'm not sure. Calm down, Ellie. Everything will be fine. One trip, not more than once. Look, until we return home, you're my girl. Just this once. Pretend to be my wife and I promise to treat you like the princess you deserve to be. No one will know and it will remain our secret forever. They checked into the room and she felt a strong sense of guilt seeing only one double bed in the room. She realized that for the first time since her wedding, she would be sleeping with another man, yet at the same time. Excitement overwhelmed her as the guilt dissipated. Mixed feelings made her dizzy, and she stepped out onto the balcony for a breath of fresh air. Richard understood the situation, quietly stowed their bags in the closet, and joined her on the balcony overlooking the Pacific Ocean. Isn't this relaxing? I booked this room knowing you'd appreciate the ocean view. She nodded with tears in her eyes. Yes, it's beautiful. Richard turned to Ellie, put his hand under her chin, and lifted her face to his. Looking deeply into her eyes, he gently kissed her lips. After a few seconds, Ellie responded to his kiss, which grew into a hot, romantic, passionate embrace with intertwining tongues. Realizing what she had just done, she gently pushed him away and smiled. Richard knew he had made progress and wasn't going to rush things. He was confident that in a few hours they would be alone. Then he planned to spend the entire night with her, showing her his passion while her completely unaware husband was far away. He felt a surge of satisfaction, smiling back at her in response. It was nice, Ellie. We have dinner in a couple of hours and I know you want to get ready so I'll head to the gym for a quick workout and be back in time to get ready too. She nodded saying nothing, watching as Richard grabbed his workout gear and left the room. Sitting on the bed, she needed to talk to David and make sure he was okay. Now that she realized how she had treated him, she wanted to apologize and make sure he was all right. She loved him and just wanted this train ride to be over so they could get back to their normal life. Her heart raced as his phone began to ring. She prayed he would answer and tell her he loved her, but there was no response. He didn't answer the call, and she knew he was angry about their last conversation. Then she sent him a text message, hoping it would help smooth things over. The text read, David, my dear, I'm so sorry for how I spoke to you during the call today. I had a rough morning, and I took it out on you. Please forgive me, and I'll make it up to you when I get home. I miss you so much and I want you to know that I love you and can't wait for us to start our family this weekend. Please call me. I need to hear your voice. After a deep sigh, she stepped into a hot shower, shaved her legs and intimate area, then washed her hair. Stepping out of the shower, she admired herself in the full-length mirror and was excited about the prospect of wearing the new outfit she had bought. For the next 30 minutes, she diligently did her makeup and hair. She was pleased with the impressive evening look and how her hair looked long and stunning. Forgetting about her message to David, she focused solely on trying on the new outfit and seeing how sexy she looked in it. Soon, her thoughts returned to David and how she would wear the same outfit for him when she returned home. Richard was in the middle of his treadmill workout when Ellie approached her suitcase of clothes and pulled out a short black cocktail dress. It was a bold choice, specially selected for this trip, accentuating her beautiful chest with a daring neckline. She decided to be bold and go braless that evening. The short skirt was meant to further enhance her long legs in combination with the new high-heeled shoes, also purchased for this trip. 
After admiring the dress for a few moments, she went for her lingerie and took out several items, including the lingerie she planned to wear for Richard that night. Arranging everything neatly on the bed, she unpacked a new pair of sheer black stockings and slid them over her long, smooth legs on top of the new black thong. No need for a bra today, so she carefully stepped into the dress, then put on the high-heeled shoes. After adjusting the dress to ensure her firm, round breasts were covered, she approached the full-length mirror and admired the sexy woman looking back at her. She smiled again with satisfaction, knowing how seductive she looked, and once more thought about how much her husband would enjoy taking off this dress and making love to her when she returned home. Then she glanced at the clock and realized Richard would be back in a few minutes, so she began tidying up. She returned to the bed to rearrange the sexy lingerie she planned to wear that night in the closet, so she could quickly change when they returned from dinner. As she picked up the bag from Victoria's Secret, she noticed it had already been opened, and all the items inside were rummaged through. Upon closer inspection, she saw a piece of paper attached to the lingerie. This oddity puzzled her, and she looked at it questioningly. Then she retrieved the delicate items and saw a handwritten note attached to the expensive lingerie. Still puzzled, she read the note and immediately froze in fear. Her heart stopped as she read the note, her world crumbling into tragedy. The realization of her actions hit her with incredible force. She was stunned, unable to move, staring at the note. Then suddenly, a river of tears flowed from her eyes, and she fell to her knees, covering her face with her hands. Now she lay on the carpet, sobbing and experiencing unimaginable pain and suffering that she couldn't comprehend. Now, seized by panic, she called David's phone and left a trembling voice message. David, I got your message, and darling, nothing happened. I didn't do anything. Please forgive me. It was a foolish mistake, and I love you. Please call me back. We need to talk. I need to talk to you, darling. Trust me, nothing happened. Please call me back. When she realized he wasn't calling back, she left several long text messages and now rocked back and forth in a large chair next to the bed. When Richard entered the room, he saw the complete catastrophe and realized something was about to disrupt his plans. What happened, dear? Don't call me that. I'm not your dear, and because of you, I could have ruined my marriage with the man I love. You've put me in this situation, and now he's left me. Ellie, calm down. What are you talking about? Richard saw the note Ellie was pointing to on the bed. A smile crept onto his face as he read it, and he once again felt that wonderful sense of satisfaction. Playing with her husband's mind, that's what he lives for. Tempting the wife and destroying their lives. It all comes back to his childhood when his father abandoned his mother for another woman, distorting him in the worst possible way. In his twisted mind, it didn't even matter if he succeeded with her. He already got what he wanted. Taking her now would just be the icing on the cake. So he let her cry it out, then convinced her that since her husband already thinks she slept with him, they might as well do it and enjoy themselves. He knew it would be a hard sell, but it was his gift. At least he believed so himself, and his past experience with cheating wives made him confident in his skills. But Ellie no longer wanted to be part of this game. She kicked off her high heels and removed her dress in front of Richard, completely ignoring his presence. He was sure she was about to pounce on him and get what she needed, his big cock. Her appearing naked right in front of him made him stiffen in anticipation as he absorbed her stunning body. He stood up and took off his pants, expecting her to satisfy him. When Ellie saw what he had done, she simply left. You're out of your mind if you think I'll ever touch you again. I need to go back home to my husband and fix the mess you've caused. Richard grew angry, realizing he would get nothing out of it, and spoke in a tone she had never heard before. Which mess did I cause? Are you stupid? You agreed to this yourself. You left your husband and agreed to sleep with me. I never forced you, and you made this choice yourself. Look at the outfit you were just wearing for our special night. It practically screams, please take me. Admit it, if you truly loved your husband, you would have never agreed to be my mistress for the weekend. You jerk, how dare you speak to me like that? You're just a brazen thug, and I want nothing to do with you. You've destroyed my happy marriage, and I have no idea how to make David forgive me and take me back. 
Damn it, if the situation were reversed, I would divorce him and make his life unbearable. I hate you and what you've done. In rage, Richard retorted, Of course it's all my fault. That kiss you gave me an hour ago speaks for itself. You enjoyed it, and you knew you wanted more. You wanted me to take you firmly and shake up your world, and you know it. Ellie looked shocked by his outburst as he continued, Just admit it and stop blaming me for wanting to change the man you claim to love. You'll never convince me you loved him and easily agreed to cheat. You're just like everyone else. You want fun on the side until you get caught. Once caught, you blame the man who tempted you. Well, princess, you would never have let me tempt you, take you on a road trip, and agree to a night of sex with me if you truly loved your husband. You didn't even object to staying in the same room and sleeping with me. Yeah, you must really love your husband. I can't imagine what you would do if you didn't love that poor guy. His words shattered her soul. She understood that he was right and that the decision had been hers alone. She blamed him for everything, but realized she could have backed out at any moment. Even her sister had warned her, but she had chosen to leave her husband and be with Richard. At that moment, she wasn't sure what hurt more, the realization that Richard was right about her, or how deeply she had wounded her husband. Consumed by remorse and guilt, she quickly gathered her belongings and descended to the lobby to inquire if the concierge could help her catch a dawn flight home. She needed to return home and tell David how much she loved him and that nothing had happened. After 20 minutes on the phone, it turned out there were no available seats on the evening flights back. She had to stay in San Diego until morning to fly home and arrive around 6 EU p.m. It was too late but with no other options, she asked them to make the changes. Then she realized she didn't have a hotel room and needed a place to stay. Seeing how distraught she was, the concierge tried to help. She told her she found a room, and if she provided her credit card, the room key would be ready in a few minutes. After handing over her credit card, she sat alone and thought about the past three months that David had written about in his letter. She realized she had indeed become a distant wife and had treated David terribly because of her guilt, venting her frustration and stress on this dear man. When she saw the concierge's expression, she became alarmed. I'm sorry, Mrs. Wallace, your card is declined. Do you have another card? Declined? Oh God, this can't be. Here, try this one. She realized that David had blocked their joint cards when the other two cards didn't work. She panicked and tried to figure out what to do next. Going back to Richard's room was out of the question. She'd rather just stay up all night and wait for morning. With no other option, she swallowed her pride and called her sister. Hello? Hi, Jenny. Sorry to bother you. It's okay, sis. What's wrong? Now, crying, Ellie broke down as soon as Jenny answered. I should have listened to you, but I didn't. David found out about my trip and left a note in my bag saying he's leaving me. I'm stuck here and trying to get home. I won't say I told you so. That would be rude. How can I help? Well, David isn't answering my calls and messages, so he's not helping me. It seems he's blocked our credit cards and I can't pay for the room. Could you give your credit card for the hotel and I'll pay you back as soon as I return? Damn, Ellie, you're supposed to be the smart sister, but lately you haven't been very careful. Of course I'll help you. She called her sister back an hour later. Jenny... Thanks for helping your foolish sister. I managed to get a room for the night. I'll fly home on the morning flight. Do you think he'll forgive me? Not sure, sis. Have you heard anything from him? No, but I left him a few messages and said nothing happened. Well, good luck to you. The fact that he knew what you were planning to do and you still went on the trip isn't the best sign. Keep trying to reach out to him and begging for his forgiveness if you want to get him back. I didn't know if she had continued her relationship with Richard or not, but it was obvious she intended to, and that was enough for me. She said she loved me, but went to another man, intending to lure him into bed. I wasn't going to start a family with such a woman or stay married to her. I turned off my phone, moved out of the apartment the next day, and headed to Austin, Texas, where I had several job offers. On Facebook, I changed my status to single and posted a photo of a cheating couple created using AI, using their shared photos where they walk together holding hands, and wrote, Ellie's new love, Richard Jones. She left me, and I filed for divorce, considering our marriage over. 
When I checked an hour later, there were dozens of comments from friends shocked by my revelation. Some women expressed their condolences for my loss and offered to talk if I needed to. Funny, but for the first time in months, I felt desired, and I realized that my life wasn't over because of my wife's infidelity. From my research, I learned that Richard was not actually in the process of divorcing and loved his wife and children. He just enjoyed seducing unsuspecting women a bit too much. He really enjoyed defiling other men's wives and turning their husbands into cuckolds. It gave him a sense of power after he had taken someone's wife, knowing the husband would be licking what he had just had. It was a real pleasure for this narcissistic individual. The need to dominate these women and their husbands was his addiction. Mr. Wilkes, where is your client? On the day of the divorce hearing, David was supposed to appear in court. When he didn't show up, the judge was furious and asked his lawyer where he was. The lawyer replied that he didn't know but was confident his client would show up soon. She announced a 15-minute break and said that if he didn't come, she would issue a warrant for his arrest. Joshua Wilkes, his lawyer, called David's mobile phone and soon realized David had no intention of attending the mandatory court session. He informed his lawyer that he was stuck in traffic. When the judge returned, Joshua stood up and addressed the judge. Your Honor, my client is stuck in traffic and is desperately trying to get here. Well, that's unfortunate. I have other matters today. Your client has shown disrespect to the court, and I'm imposing a fine of $1,000. I've reviewed the case and demand that three counseling sessions be conducted before the next court hearing, which will take place in 60 days. Inform your client that if he fails to attend the counseling sessions or appear in court, I will sentence him to 30 days of imprisonment and impose an additional fine. Do you understand my decision today? Yes, Your Honor. Joshua admonished his client and told him it's best to comply with the judge's order. Despite his reluctance towards the mandatory counseling, he agreed and stated he would fulfill this condition if it helped expedite the divorce process. It was the first time she had seen David since her foolish decision to be with Richard. She rushed to him with open arms, only to be pushed away and ignored. After she managed to compose herself after the burst of tears it caused, the counselor began the session. Ellie initiated the session. She told David how much she loved him, how sorry she was, and how she didn't understand what she was doing. She went on to explain that she and Richard didn't have any sexual relations, and she returned home as soon as she realized her actions. She cried and begged for his forgiveness. When it was his turn to speak, he began with a question. Doctor, just to be clear, you expect full honesty from both of us if these sessions are to have any value, correct? Yes, David, you both agreed to full honesty, and this session is without accusations. It's important for both of you to speak freely and honestly. Thank you, doctor. Turning to Ellie and looking directly at her for the first time since her departure, he felt his heart race with the resurgence of pain and suffering. This is hard for me, Ellie, and I hope you'll be honest. You say there was nothing between you and Richard, and I need to understand and forgive your actions. Did I understand correctly? Tears filled her eyes as she smiled and said, Yes, David, nothing happened, and when I read your letter, I realized what I was doing and ran home to you. Okay, I understand, but I know you, Ellie, and you're not the type of woman to be with another man. I mean, you've never been frivolous or that kind of woman. Do you agree? Of course not. I'm not frivolous, and you know that, she said, reaching out to David. He didn't take her hand, and it hung in the air until Ellie withdrew it. I know you're not like that, Ellie, but I also know you wouldn't have slept with another man if you didn't have feelings or connections to him. You see, since I know you're not frivolous... I understand you had feelings for Richard, right? She realized she had to admit to having feelings or agree that she was frivolous and quietly said, Well, yes, but I don't love him. I only loved you. Yes, I loved you too, Ellie. But here's the problem with this whole story. Yes, I consider it betrayal. Tell me, did you spend time alone with him? Have lunch together? Drink after work? We work together, of course. Okay, that makes sense, so I'll take that as a yes. Tell the truth, Ellie. Have you ever walked with him, holding hands? Ellie couldn't bear to look him in the eye anymore and said very quietly, Yes. Sorry, I can't hear you. 
Did you hold hands with him? Yes, but I didn't love him. You've said that before. I know you didn't love him. Tell me, have you ever passionately kissed him? Just once, I swear. David couldn't explain what happened, but all his pain, anger, resentment, and humiliation found an outlet in tears. Her confession unleashed a flood of tears in him. As he spoke, tears streamed down his face onto his shirt and knees. David was a big, strong guy who never cried, and when Ellie saw this, it had an effect on her she didn't expect. As the tears flowed, David looked her straight in the eyes and calmly asked another question. Ellie, one last question. If I hadn't sent that note along with the underwear you planned to wear for your lover, would you have slept with him that night? She didn't want to answer and sat there, nervous, watching his tears continue to fall. After a moment, the doctor spoke. Ellie, it's important to speak up now. You're safe and you shouldn't hold back. Please, answer David's question. David, I love you and would never intentionally hurt you, but if you hadn't stopped me with that note, I would have made the biggest mistake of my life and slept with him. But you saved me, and for that, I am eternally grateful to you. Darling, we need to stay together. Addressing the doctor through tears, David said, Doctor, this is why I can't stay in the marriage. You see, she had every intention of sleeping with him. The fact itself is irrelevant. Intention is everything to me. If she was willing to do it once, I know she would do it again under the right circumstances. And I can't live with that over my head. Throughout all our years together, I would remember her intention to be with someone she desired more than our marriage. I would always wonder if she wants it again or plans another rendezvous. No, she was done with everything when she boarded that plane, knowing all along what she was going to do. Over the next three weeks, David attended the necessary sessions, and within three months the divorce was finalized, but not without constant calls and pleas to stop the divorce and give her another chance. Calls from her father, her sister, and their friends were all the same. They all told him he was a fool because she didn't sleep with Richard. David tried to explain how he felt, but in everyone's eyes he was supposed to forgive her, mistake, and reunite in marriage. She loved him, he was acting like a child, and he needed to man up, take responsibility, and take her back. After growing tired of hearing how his little ego was hindering their reconciliation, he eventually told each of them to go to and cut off contact with them. After that, he took on several contract jobs across the country, left town, and never looked back. Ellie still called and begged for forgiveness, and eventually he had to block her number. He thought she finally understood. She was still young and would find another man, but he hoped she had learned a lesson and would remain faithful in her future relationships. It's been almost a year since that dreadful day but I never forgot about little Richard. Now I was working on the other side of the country, unconnected to home. That's when I began to enact my plan of revenge. Before leaving town, I set up remote access to the home internet, granting me entry to Ellie's PC. She had a habit of returning from work, connecting to the corporate VPN, and sending reports. Of course, once finished, she simply closed her laptop, thinking the system was off. Taking advantage of the lax security on her laptop, I remotely accessed her system, still connected to the corporate intranet via VPN. Gotta love lazy tech support employees who prefer to make their own jobs easier than worry about security. I make a lot of honest money this way, so I really can't complain. But I digress. Next, I opened her email and sent a scripted email to Richard with a rootkit embedded in a link he'd surely open. The email seemingly from Ellie, read, Richard, check out these photos and tell me how I look. Unable to resist such an email from Ellie, he'd click the link. The link would activate the malware, swiftly installing itself on every server Richard had access to, waiting for my commands while he only saw an error message. He'd try a few times before realizing the link wasn't working, asking Ellie about it the next day. As expected, the prey took the bait granting me access to the company's treasure trove. Then, I wiped any evidence of the email sent by Ellie and the remote access logs on her laptop, and when the IT department checked, they wouldn't find any trace of the email, link, or incident records. With a bit of luck, 
their IT personnel would simply ignore the report and move on to more pressing issues. I waited a week before commencing my activity. Using VPN and several remote servers in eight different countries, I installed several programs on Richard's company's main server to aid me in completing my task. Within hours, I had access to their most valuable files, downloading the company's financial reports, HR salaries, engineering blueprints, and patent approval projects. These patents could cost the company millions. Then I wanted to have some fun with Richard, and through his work computer, I registered him on several adult websites, including two that were in the deep and dark web. Gaining access to his life through his computer, I used his credit card and banking information. It was easy to register him and use his company computer without his knowledge. I set up a program to redirect any messages from these sites to a hidden file that I created on his computer, accessible only to me. In this secret hidden file, I uploaded dozens of images and videos with prohibited information, company diagrams, and confidential engineering documents, starting my Burn Richard campaign. Over the next month, using his company email account, I sent several documents to their leading competitors from his company email account with a note asking when payments would be transferred to his account. Then I performed basic deletion of the sent emails. Richard was hired for his financial experience, not technical skills, so like most newcomers, he thought that once the emails and files were deleted, all traces would disappear. But with any type of investigation, evidence would be easy to find. Next, from his computer, I began sending prohibited information to sites that I knew were monitored by the FBI. Within a week, I sent over 100 images that would definitely attract FBI attention. At the same time, I paid one of my employees to drop a USB drive with dozens of images of prohibited information into Richard's apartment. It took them less than two days to find a way inside and install the device. All of this was part of my plan. Of course, throughout the process, I was cautious. Using VPNs and several remote servers, as well as my experience in cybersecurity, to erase any possible links to myself. Ten days after the incident, a team of six FBI agents stormed into Richard's office while he was meeting with the company president. Armed agents burst in shouting, FBI, nobody move! Causing the entire office to freeze in fear, watching in silence and immobility. We have an arrest warrant for Richard Jones and full access to your company's servers. We have information regarding the commission of federal crimes. Please escort us to your IT department immediately, the president said with disdain as he looked at Richard, then gestured for two FBI agents to follow him to the IT department. Despite the president's objections, the FBI seized the company's servers and all data, leaving it completely paralyzed. When this became known, competitors quickly seized the opportunity, calling clients. Richard, with his misdeeds and my assistance, effectively destroyed the company, after which he was fired and prosecuted. Richard's case received widespread publicity. The company where he worked found itself in a difficult situation and might not survive the consequences of his actions. The scandal undermined the company's reputation and made Richard a national laughingstock. He was found guilty on 200 counts, including possession of child pornography, wire fraud, corporate espionage, federal theft, and extortion. He was sentenced to 25 years in prison. His wife filed for divorce, and his children never spoke to him again. He lost everything trying to deceive the wrong person. As a side note, Ellie became collateral damage after the story of her relationship with Richard became public. The story was published on several major national news websites. For some reason, these sites were hacked, and the story spread actively online for a week. Headlines told the story of the cheating wife and her relationship with a pedophile arrested on Valentine's Day. The hacker gave him a nickname in the articles after the arrest. Happy Valentine's Day, Ellie. Ellie's photo, her address, place of work, and divorce became public information. She couldn't go anywhere without hearing insults and facing judgmental looks. And I started a new life from scratch. That's the end of the story. Write your opinion in the comments about this story. 
It will be interesting for us to read it. Also, do not forget to like and subscribe to our channel so as not to miss new, equally interesting and exciting stories. Good luck!